Hey, Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom, for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. It's good, it's good to see you again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, so for folks listening, if you haven't met Brian yet, Brian Cohen is the author of Ted Saves the World. It's the first book in a young adult science fiction fantasy series. And he's also the author of a collection of several different creative writing prompts books. His books have been downloaded over 400,000 times. And Brian is an absolute expert when it comes to copywriting, which is like, how do you actually write great book descriptions for your books on Amazon to get readers to actually buy what you have for, for sale. So Brian, how did you get started as an author in the first place? Uh, well, I, I was always really interested in writing. I mean, it's kind of how everybody gets the bug. They're kind of excited during those creative writing assignments during middle and high school, I guess. But uh, for self-publishing, when, when I started getting into that, originally I had a blog where I was actually trying to kind of fire myself up uh, and write about writing inspiration because uh, one of the best ways to uh, learn about something is to teach it. And so I started kind of on that journey of figuring out, well, what's the best way to get people fired up for writing? And it turned out uh, writing prompts ended up being uh, something that Google kept sending me traffic for, which was nice. And eventually I said, well, uh, I need to make a little money off of this. Why don't I throw these into a book, put them up on Amazon? And that was around August 2010. And people started picking them up and had a really successful couple of years with those. And then uh, I'd always, my passion had always been fiction. So I was, after four or five years of trying to inspire others to write stuff, I said, oh, I guess I should do it myself. And, and then, uh, I've written six novels now to this point. So that was kind of the beginning to now on the writing side. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So uh, that's interesting. Though. So why did you start with nonfiction? Like, why didn't you just start with your novel? Well, it, it's, it's, I think it's kind of good the way that it worked out because I was writing fiction. I just was having trouble finishing fiction. I think I had about five or six unfinished novels. Like a lot of people I tried National Novel Writing Month. I uh, uh, wrote over 50,000 words, wrote over 70,000 words in that novel, never finished it. Uh, and it wasn't until getting kind of into the publishing world, learning more about outlining and writing beats and getting all of that set up uh, that I ended up finishing fiction. So I think the reason I start, it's one of those weird things. Uh, I'm, you know, just, you know, full disclosure, I'm good at writing nonfiction. I write good essays. I studied English in college. I, I, I got to a good point with that. Uh, fiction is the passion and nonfiction for the writing side of things is just comes naturally. So take that for what you will. But I, I think it was good the way I started things out because it led me to, to writing the fiction in a way that I could, you know, actually close the book and say, that's done. I can put it online. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, you know, what I found from my experience is that writing fiction and nonfiction and studying how to write fiction and nonfiction really go well together because, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's a very different, right? It's very different writing, you know, a self-help book from a fantasy novel. But yeah. when you actually get down to the writing process, the, you know, the productivity habits, the strategies, you know, the concept of entertaining the reader and communicating clearly, it's all really fundamentally the same. It's just kind of a different method mm -hmm. of going about it. The, the thing that, that put me over the edge into writing fiction properly was actually a nonfiction book by Steve Scott on, uh, on writing more efficiently. And so the nonfiction helped my fiction. It was a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's great. So actually, this also thing happened for me. So what made me a much better nonfiction writer was when I read 2K to 10K by Rachel Aaron. Nice. It's a book on how you actually plot novels. And mm. I just found her whole strategy, her whole concept around, you know, planning the book out, planning every step of the process out. I found so applicable to nonfiction. It helped me become much more productive as well. She's one of those authors who that's really one of her only forays into nonfiction. And it does really well. Her fiction is really good. And she does really well on her fiction. So she's 
it, it's good that you kind of stumbled on her because you found like the one nonfiction thing she did. But uh, yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, whatever you like, you never know where the tips are going to come from, you know, like it's the weirdest places. And then you put them into practice and they work and it's awesome. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about copywriting because I know that's what you're an absolute expert in. I know you have like lots of clients who actually hire you and pay you tons of money to like basically write copy for them for, to sell their books or products or so forth. So, uh, you know, first of all, like what is copywriting? Because I think a lot of authors don't even know what that means. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's like the first stumbling block when trying to say, Hey, uh, copywriting is important as an author. They say, well, what the heck is copywriting? I don't even know what that is. Uh, copywriting are the best. Here's the best way I've, I've been able to put it. Copywriting is all the words that go outside of your book. So the words on your back cover, the words that go on Amazon, the words that go in any advertisements you use, Facebook, BookBub, Amazon ads, uh, Twitter kind of got rid of its good ads, but there's ads all over the place. And when you are trying to get people who don't know you uh, to, to trust you enough to actually make a sale, to actually click a buy button or join an email list, you need the words outside of your book to be pretty darn good uh, and, and pretty convincing in order to get the sales, get the reviews, get the subscribers, all of that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, what would you say is like the most important or one or two most important pieces of copywriting that every author should really focus time and energy and effort on? So the number one thing by far is the first line of your book description, which can be repurposed in a lot of different places. It could be used in ads. It can be used anywhere. But having that really stellar first line can actually, I've seen it double sales. I've seen it uh, help people take books that were probably going to do pretty well anyway to really new heights. That first line is so important because in copywriting, there's a statistic that goes around that says 80% of people stop reading copy after the first line. And so that's true for book descriptions. That's true for ads. So if you have a first line that is kind of long or jumbled or it doesn't make sense or it's not interesting, you lose people. And it's so weird to think, okay, I wrote this 80,000 word novel and you're telling me this one sentence has more importance over my book than all the words that I put inside there. And to a certain extent, it is true, which I know is like, it, it feels like I'm crapping on the work that you've done. No, I'm not. I'm just saying, if you do a little more work on getting that one line as awesome as it can possibly be, it's going to get you some results. So that's the first thing I would say. I would say the second thing, and this is just uh, copywriting 101 in a way, is you need to ask for things. At the end of your book descriptions, you need to say, click the link to buy the book. In your emails, when you're sending those out, you need to say, click the link and register to join this thing. In your ads, you need to say, tap the link if it's mobile, tap the link to buy the book. You need to actually tell people to do things. We're, I don't know if it's because we're modest or because we don't want to be salesy, but like that's something so many authors I see forget to do. And they probably miss out on hundreds or thousands of dollars of sales in a career because of missing that step. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, let's talk about the headline first, like the first line of your book description um, you know, like a lot of copywriters, they talk about like headlines, like, you know, and it kind of came from like the days of like writing advertisements for like newspapers and stuff, mm -hmm. right? You got the big headline at the top. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing with Amazon now is that you can actually like, you know, you can add HTML to your book descriptions. You can have like a big H2 tag. So you have this big headline at the top of your book description. Mm -hmm. you're looking at your books now on Amazon, they all have those H2 tags, those big headlines at the front. Yep. Um, so how do you go about writing a headline? What, ma what makes a good headline? So I think a good headline fits kind of five criteria and we'll see without my notes if I can remember all five. So they need to be short, they need to be interesting, 
They need to be genre specific. They need to make sense. And the fifth one will come to me in a second. We'll focus on the other four for now. But it needs to be short. I've definitely had a situation where I was running an ad uh, to a book and I didn't realize my headline was actually getting cut off because it was too long. Um, because I was trying to tout all the awesome benefits of buying my box set. So if it's too long, you're probably losing out on some people who just want something short, sweet, to the point. It needs to be interesting. It needs to be the kind of thing where, okay, that sounds cool. I want to move on to the next line. I was reading a book. Um, this is the ad the Adweek Copywriting Handbook. I'm always trying to learn more about this stuff by Joseph Sugarman. And he said, the number one goal of the first line of your copy is to get people to read the second line. How do you do that? It needs to be interesting. It needs to be compelling. It needs to be genre specific. So if you're writing a thriller, well, you probably don't want to emphasize the romance in the headline because you've got thriller readers. They like reading about thriller stuff like chase against time and there's a big terrorist and explosions. They want to know that stuff is in there. They, you want it to make sense. So you, you want it to make sure that once you put together something really short, tight, interesting, uh, you want to make sure, okay, well, will most people understand what I'm talking about? And if, if I'm doing fantasy, am I referencing three weird names in my headline that no one will know? Uh, or am I keeping it pretty, uh, like understandable for the rest of the population? And the fifth one will come to me, but basically if you follow those four, you're in really good shape. Yeah, definitely. So how do you go about the process of writing a headline? Like, uh, you know, cause I know, you know, I look at, you know, writing the book title and the subtitle as copywriting. Right. And I look at that. Oh, as definitely. Mine. Oh, definitely. And yeah. I mean, you're the genius when it comes to keywords and, and research with that stuff. And I would totally agree with you. And, and I mean, you're flipping through some of my books. You see my nonfiction books. It's like my sub headlines are all, you know, got those keywords and, um, and they're really trying to work that with the series. The series title, of course, needs to, needs to have strong keywords and copywriting in there. But I would say for your headline, you almost need to think of it not like prose when we're trying to write our book. We write a rough draft, then we edit that rough draft. We're usually focused on the words we've already put down. For a headline, I recommend you sit down, your pad of paper, your open Word document, and you write 20 different ideas. You don't just write one. You write 20 different ideas. So it's more, almost more like poetry. You're trying to just come up with as many different ideas for that one line as possible. And eventually... Once you get through, usually the first five or so ideas are not that good. That's just kind of how it works. But as you kind of think more, as you like get into a flow, you kind of have your subconscious working, you're going to get some really interesting ideas in there. And those are probably the ones you're, you say, okay, these might be workable. Then run them by your readers, run them by any author groups you're in, see which ones they think are the best. And then those are the ones you edit. So you don't just put down one idea and edit it because usually it's one of those first five crap ideas. But eventually you come up with some different ideas, really off the wall stuff, try anything possible, narrow them down and then edit from there. Yeah, that's really great advice. And I think that's, that's a similar process that I go through with the book titles and headlines is like, you know, write down 10, 20 different ideas uh, and, you know, no matter how terrible they are, <laughs> usually a lot of them are pretty terrible in my experience. <laughs> yeah. um, and the other thing I've noticed too, is that like, once I do that, like once I go through the writing the 10 or 20 headlines or whatever, I might not necessarily, like, those 20 might not, none of them might be any good. Right. Um, yeah. But what I've noticed is that once I do that, you know, maybe I'll be in the shower, I'll be taking a walk, I'll be like working out. And then all of a sudden this idea will come to me and that, that's the headline. Like that's the book title. Like that's the great idea. Yeah. But I found that I don't really get those great ideas until I've gone through that work of actually putting, you know, lots of different ideas together. And so like when I have, you know, when we work with clients, 
when I'm working with clients to get, you know, good titles or good headlines for their work, um, I'm always like, you know, give me at least 10 different ideas. Like if mm. you haven't gotten 10 different ideas yet, you don't really have anything to show, right? Because maybe you just yeah. get one idea in the shower, but you don't know if it's actually good. So I think that's a crucial part of this creative process is just getting the volume in place and writing as much as you can. And then once you have a bunch of ideas, then choose the best idea out of all of those. And I think it gets easier when you've worked on, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, as you work on this copywriting stuff more and more. Nowadays, I don't have to come up with quite as many ideas because I'm kind of in the flow state on that stuff immediately. But when you're first starting out, 10 ideas, 20 ideas is definitely a necessity. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, okay, what's next then? So once you, you talked about, you know, the headline, the first uh, line of your book description is to get people to read the second line of your book description, right? So mm -hmm. can you kind of lay out a, a formula or an idea or a strategy of a way to craft a book description that, you know, like a complete book description from beginning to end, like how would you go about that process? Totally. Well, I have a different, kind of a different format for fiction and nonfiction because they're definitely different. Uh, for fiction, I go with the headline. I go with the synopsis. I do something called the selling paragraph. Then I do the call to action. For nonfiction, I have the kind of headline. I have expertise, where you establish yourself as an expert in the subject. I have the benefits. Then I have the selling paragraph and the uh, um, call to action in there. So for fiction, writing a synopsis, it's, it's tough. I actually wrote a whole book on it because even just the synopsis, uh, it's, it's challenging because you feel when you've written an 80,000 word novel, how the heck am I going to condense this down into 250 words? It just seems insane. And you're not really trying to uh, condense everything because it's not about the plot. Really what it comes down to with a fiction book is you want to introduce that character because you want to make sure that the reader who doesn't know who you are, doesn't know who you're, what your book's about, they feel a connection with that character. And then you explain kind of the basics, most interesting parts of your book's plot through the eyes of that character. Now, that doesn't mean it's in first person. It can be. I usually do third person. But you want to introduce that character if it's, you know, a 40-year-old divorcee and it's part of a second chance romance, readers who read that kind of genre are probably going to feel a connection with this 40-year-old divorcee. If it's a young adult superhero novel and you've got young adult readers who like that stuff, you want to say, hey, we've got this 17-year-old kid from the wrong side of the tracks. Like, you want to know that. Because then as you see what other plot stuff is unfolding in that synopsis, you already have a connection to it. As opposed to if you just go into an explosion just happened in London, thousands of people are running around. It's like, okay, yeah, that maybe is a little exciting, but do I know anyone who just was in that explosion? Do I care? More often than not, no. So you need to establish that caring first and then everything else is almost gravy. It's a lot easier once you've made that connection. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So it's really about setting up the character and getting the reader to care about the characters first and foremost. Exactly. And it's harder if you have like 20 characters. I recommend you don't do more than uh, two or three. BookBub just came out with a study that three, I believe it's three or more character names convert worse than three than less than three character names so you want to keep things simple yeah that's a really good point i mean i've, I've read some book descriptions for novels and it's like there's like 18 different characters or something some <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're it's like a shakespearean like, play like, or something so confused. i don't really want to buy this book because i'm so confused already just reading the description of it <laughs> yeah exactly and uh you know this as well as i do the confused mind says no and so don't let them get confused <laughs> Definitely. Well, so it's really interesting too, because I mean, if you look at something like Game of Thrones, like one of the most popular, you know, TV shows of all time and very popular novels now, you know, I mean, there's like hundreds of characters and like, you know, hundreds of characters die in that, in that mm -hmm. series. Um, so how would you go about something like that with like so many characters and so many different storylines and so many subplots in this epic fantasy world? I mean, how would you 
boil it down to one or two characters in a synopsis. It's all about focusing on what the reader is going to like. I've read the first Game of Thrones. I've read the first four and I've kind of spoiled myself on the series a little bit. So I, I basically know what's happening, but um, what would you, what would you concentrate on in Game of Thrones? If you are trying to get people excited, you're probably focusing on the Stark family because they're kind of the main characters of the first book. Uh, you could go into all this stuff about Cersei, Lannister, and you could go into Tyrion and all of that stuff. But more often than not, fantasy story, you've got this king, you've got this family, you focus on the thing that people are going to connect with the most. And maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you say, no, I think we need to focus on Tyrion. Fine, you focus on the scheming, impish guy. Whatever you think is the focus that readers are going to connect with the most, 